Dr. Marisa Snyder, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm very excited to have you. We are old friends and I was just on your pod and I'm so excited to have you on and share all your knowledge. Can you introduce yourself quickly to the audience for me? Yes, I am a women's health expert and uh, author, podcaster, a mama to a toddler, <laughs> almost three-year-old. It is so crazy to have a three-year-old and be in perimenopause at the same time. There is something to be said about that. I, I really would love for us as a society and as researchers to do more research into that, about that, you know, being a mom in the lived experience of young children and also be in the throes of major hormone shifts and changes and kind of what that lens to. Um, and, you know, my work in the world is really showing up to serve women so that they show up to feel alive, their most alive selves. And I find that that aliveness really has that opportunity to come up to the forefront in this perimenopause and menopause transition, because we are not accommodating to life and to people the way that we used to, that always excites me. But I also want women, as we are stepping into our truth and our power, that we have the metabolic health and the vitality to do so the way that we want to. Yes, yes. So you just had me on your pod recently, like I mentioned, and we talked all about metabolic health and all about perimenopause. And I got to tell you my side. So I'm really excited to have you on today to talk about your take on it. Because my audience is, I think, generally in that age group, they're either perimenopause or menopausal, or they're older folks, men and women. And I just think your take on things is you've got such a vibrancy. You, When I met you at a conference years ago, you were like, rocking the big, beautiful dresses and the colorful, you know, outfits, and you just always bring such a light to things. So I think we're going to have a fun conversation. Yes. 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 <laughs> in, in our black tank tops. I know. <laughs> we're twinsies. <laughs> Mine says no one is coming to save you. <laughs> Nobody is. <laughs> and I think women know that, or we're learning that, you know, I, I think we're beginning to really understand that nobody's coming to save us. If we want to thrive, we have got to, we've got to take control and, and do it ourselves. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of talk and I'm sure you get this too in social media where people want to complain about the medical system. They want to complain that doctors are lacking. They want to complain that they don't get enough time. They want to complain there's not enough resources. And I get all that and I appreciate all that. And I think that we can shout from the rooftops all day, more studies, more data, more of this and that. But I think at the end of the day, we have to take the reins ourselves yeah. and we have to educate ourselves and we have to create a knowledge base that we own. And I appreciate that about you too, because I know that you get that and your whole mission on this planet clearly is to empower people to own their shit. So yeah. that's, you know, that's the jam. Yeah. I learned that lesson at a very, very young age that no one was coming to save me. And honestly, because of all that, probably because of that survivalness that I was kind of embedded in at a very young age, that level of trauma lended to kind of having survival, being in a survival mode for too long and ultimately landed me into some kind of chronic issues. But I realized that it was only gonna be me that was gonna crawl myself out of that as well. And so, you know, I think the sooner that we understand that even if you've got the best doctors, even if you've got people in your corner, you've built a team, you're still running that team. You're still the CEO of that team. Just like every woman is running their lives, taking care of their families, taking care of the people around them, you know, in their careers, we have to own our health the way that we own every other piece. I mean, it's not like we're not used to it. You know, we, <laughs> it is, it's what we know. You know, yeah. I, I think there, I mean, I get the need for us to want to be taken care of in that way, but I think we just got to own the fact that is really our responsibility, just like everything else is. <laughs> Absolutely. I find online that I would love to hear you speak to is I get people dropping into my DMs or into yeah. my posts and they say, and the comments and they say, well, Dr. So-and-so said this and you said this and doctors, other Dr. So-and-so said this, and I just don't know what to believe. Mm. And I get so frustrated because I'm like, just freaking think, like think this true through. I'm trying to teach people how to use critical thinking skills, not just preach at them. Can yeah. you speak to that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. That same thing. Like, oh, well, you made this statement about menopause or about hormones or whatever it is. And so said this, you know, what am I supposed to believe? And 
in, in that moment, I think we do need to be using critical thinking. I think a lot of us are looking for that definitive answer and we're not willing to go into ourselves. But what I know to be true is that each and every one of us, and, and I get that a lot of people don't always want to hear this, but we are bio-individual. And what is true for me, it may not necessarily be true for you. You know, what I'm eating for my body because of the things that are going on in my system may not be 100% true for you. Are there pillars? Yes. Are there some truths that probably are universal and don't change, like getting outside and sunlight, optimizing your mitochondria, you know, lifting weights, resistance training, ensuring that you are eating metabolically in a sense, you know, fueling your body and your mitochondria, like those are truths, but there's going to be nuance. There's always going to be nuance that's right for you. I don't do well with gluten and dairy. I, there are the people in my family, in my immediate family that do. And so, you know, there gets to be nuance. That's a truth for me. It's just the way it is and, until I continue to figure out what's going on. And then th that can be true for them. And so I think we have to connect it to what is true for us and then make modifications. I know when I build programs, when I build detoxes or a metabolic program and people are like, well, what about I've got celiacs or I got this or I have this, I have hajis, I've got. And I was like, well, then adapt it to your needs. Like this is the framework and then make it work for you. You know, you're not, it's going to be real. You're going to be hard pressed to find a program, something that's more general, that's going to exactly fit into your specific box. You've got to make it work for you. Just like I freaking make it work for me. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's the answer I was looking for. It's an interesting age group that we serve because yes. I, <laughs> cause I don't accommodate anymore. <laughs> right. Right. There's a, there's kind of this like F you thing that happens when you hit 40 where you're like, I just don't give an F yeah. about so mm. many things, but then also comes with that some hormonal imbalances. And I'll say this very kindly because I appreciate this and I, I do, I honor the individuality of each person and the journey they're on. But something I found when I was in clinical practice, doing a lot of bioidentical hormone replacement, something that I find online is sometimes that hormonal shift can create, obviously, you know, and we'll talk about this, like the brain fog and the inability to really comprehend things the way you used to. And I know that this is true for me. Like I uh, asked my podcast producer that you just met, Marisa, <laughs> my brain is not what it was, but folks will get really kind of ruminating and nitpicky about like, well, you said this three years ago, and now you're saying this, and then so-and-so saying this, and they start to like ruminate on the fine details. And then they say, well, I just don't know what to do. I don't know what to believe. And they get really frustrated. I find this mostly with women. I think it's an estrogen issue. I think it's a hormonal issue in general. And what I'm hearing you say, and what I totally agree with is that learn the information, take what you need, mm -hmm. try what you'll try and let go of the rest. You mm -hmm. know, like it, it, it's a trial and error situation. And what works for me or you may not be the same to each other, may not be the same to our followers. And also isn't the same for my husband, who's exactly the same age as me because he's a man. <laughs> so right. there's Dr. Stacey Sims. There's so many folks talking to kind of in this age group that we are other female doctors, but there's no one size fits all. You no. have to just take the information, learn what you need to learn, research further what you feel like you need to research further. Stop listening to these blanket statements on Instagram and start educating oneself and really, you know, trying it out, seeing what, what feels good, what doesn't. Yeah. I mean, Instagram, it's a place for good marketing. Yes. <laughs> Yay, if, if you are winning on Insta, you got a big following. It's that you've got a big message and you've got great marketing. I want to speak into, you know, I think it's, I mean, it's definitely hormones for sure that's shifting, but also I think it's, it's trauma. It's a lot of yeah. trauma. It's a lot of stuff. And, you know, you read one more thing that doesn't connect with you and it feels kind of like an assault on your system. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of it too. And I, I think sometimes we got to ask ourselves, like, why am I feeling so outraged about this? Why am I feeling so triggered by this? You know, why, why isn't this landing for me? And kind of dig a little bit deeper. I know that's super uncomfortable and nobody wants to do that work. I get it. But I, you got to tap in. Anytime I read something on social and I have a response, like I feel my body contract and I kind of get into that, you know, just like F you mentality of like, huh, huh, what is that about? What, what about me? <laughs> What about my stuff is being triggered by this? 
Like what is coming up for me? What are my values or my limiting beliefs? Or what is it about how I feel about myself or in my journey that has me reacting in this way? Like, I think we really need to put the onus back on ourselves when we find ourselves reacting and responding. So I feel like we're so reactive and we're, we, we, you see people so angry and, and, you know, we rarely go inward and ask ourselves like, man, why didn't I respond that way? Right. You know? And I, no, I think I that we need to do more of that. As a new mom, I, I consider myself a new mom. As someone who wants to be more patient and more empathetic and more compassionate to this little person whose life is not easy for a th almost three-year-old, you know, it's a lot of things that they're trying to figure out. I, I think about how I respond to him and then, you know, translate that to how I respond in the world. And I really question a lot of God, why did I, why am I feeling this way in this moment? Like, you know, anytime we're given the business to a little person, if that's our stuff, that, that, that little person isn't trying to do anything. Like they're just trying to live in the lived experience of being, you know, of, of trying to figure out this crazy world. If I'm reacting, I got to ask myself, well, why the heck are you reacting that way? And so I think the same way, like when we get on social, like one, what are we trying to get out of it? And why are we responding in the way that we're responding? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think the magic comes in learning to pause and just keep scrolling. But yeah. I, the reason I bring it up is because I would have patients come in. It's no different on social media than it was in my practice is what I'm trying to say, because I would mm. have patients come in and they would get they would present almost with a bit of neurosis and my staff, you know, they could be quite challenging for my staff and my staff would say, gosh, you know, Mrs. So-and-so was really hard on me today or whatever. And I'm like, just give her three months and let the hormones kick in that we've just applied. And I promise you, <laughs> and the lifestyle management changes that I'm suggesting, like just give her three months and a different person will be in front of you. Because when your hormones start to balance out a bit, those triggers become less triggering. You know, the things that really kind of send you off into the extremes seems to yeah. happen less and less when you've got the right things balanced out. So much of that, I mean, yeah, we can apply hormones all day, but so much of that is just lifestyle, right? Oh, and absolutely. This, I was going to say blood sugar imbalance. Yeah. You know, again, that, that contributes to mood swings and, you know, changes in our neurotransmitters. But yeah, I mean, you start going down the road of perimenopause into menopause and you don't have progesterone to support you in that second part of the cycle. Like don't meet me on day 27. <laughs> mm -mm. Don't stay away. Oh, that's so true. I schedule, I literally schedule my life around Absolutely. those few days. <laughs> my husband schedules his life. My family schedules their life around my late luteal phase. Yeah. You know, was, uh, we have to, I'm actually, I'm writing a full solo episode right now on perimenopausal rage. And, you know, I grew up with a mom who had PMDD and in the eighties that wasn't diagnosable, but my sister and I were abused emotionally and physically. And I didn't know why when you're young, you don't understand why your mom is flashing out of nowhere and just losing her stuff. Like I used to think she was like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, and it would just happen out of nowhere. Um, and she was a single mom and it was a very hard life, no doubt. But man, when her hormones shifted and she was dealing with, in looking back in hindsight, it had to be PMDD and, and she would have these extreme rage moments. Well, when she got into her mid to late forties, it got extremely severe. Like it amplified 10 X and she would lock herself in her room or her house for three to four days right before her period, because she knew she was going to light up any stranger that accidentally cut her off, that took a parking spot, you know, anything. And I remember she went to her OBGYN at that point and she said, is it normal for me to want to kill somebody in these days leading up to my period? And the doctor had said, actually validated her, didn't gaslight her and said, yeah, it's totally normal. Didn't have anything for her, by the way. Got nothing for you. But yes, that's a normal experience for you. And on your way, good luck with this rage that you're experiencing that just really tortured my mom. And I remember growing up in my, you know, this was my twenties and thirties and thinking one of the reasons why I went into this work was like, okay, how do I not only help women in this, but also how do I mitigate this from happening to me? And in the last couple of months, I want to say around the time that I had my concussions in June, I noticed a major shift for me. And I know that concussions can drive rage too in their own right. But ever since then, 
I've had it's really intense, what I call my mother's version of perimenopausal rage. And I am down the rabbit hole trying to figure it out. But one of the things my husband and I met up about was how do we manage this until I can figure out how to transform it, you know, and, and a part of me is like, is this trauma that my mother just passed on over to me? Is it, or is it just hormones? Is it a combination of things, but it's real. And I feel like I am going to, I feel like I get possessed. I feel like it takes over my body and I feel under-resourced. I feel like everything is just, it's beyond hard that the things are just too difficult to manage and I just lose it. And I'm a mom who I made a commitment to never yell or raise my voice at my son because that's all I grew up in. And when I get in this week leading up to my period, it is it takes every ounce of self-control and discipline to not pop off at my yeah. child. I'm just just trying to get him in his car seat for F's sake. <laughs> like just yeah. Lots of breathing, lots of breathing. And so what we've done is we have more babysitters. My husband takes my son more in this time. Everybody knows we've developed a plan around, around this rage that I'm experiencing that I can't seem to get control of right now. Well, it's real. It's, it's real. I'm, it's real. I understand it. I appreciate it. I have it too. I think knowing that it's there and then exactly what you're doing, like just mitigating it. Your poor mom. I mean, that story hurts my heart because she obviously was, you know, that was I'm very likely torturing her as well. We don't ever oh, want to yell at our kids. I have a no, 23 year beat your kids. You don't want to yell at your kids. You don't want to abuse them. No, she and- was out of control. I know what it feels like now. I mean, she was yeah. literally out of control of her body and being a single mom, no money. And, and you have horrible rage? Like, what do you do when no one even tells you this is what's happening to you? Your hormones are depleted. You've got no neurotransmitters. You know, you're carrying trauma from your mother's abuse, you know? And your blood sugar is screwy. Yeah. And you're just eating peanut M&Ms over here on the side, which my mother absolutely (laughs) was. (laughs) Well, and then oftentimes, well, so I was that mom. I mean, I was not anywhere near that severe, but I was the single mom trying to make ends meet, you know, dealing with a child by myself and even, you know, with pretty severe PMS and hormonal dysfunction, even in my thirties, twenties and thirties, I had my daughter at 25, but she's 23 now. And no joke. There's times when it'll, it makes me want to cry. It'll strike me. Some of the fights we had, some of the rages I went into and I'll just text her and I'll be like, I am so sorry for what happened on that day. And she'll always write me back and say, it's okay, mom, you were doing the best you could. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it, you know, you don't want to lash out, but it is so crazy what low progesterone will do to your brain and what stress, just what stress stress will do. I don't think people appreciate what stress does to your body. It literally shrinks your brain. It destroys any potential for good neurotransmission gets really do it on in blanket statements on Instagram. It's an untethering is what it feels like for so many women. I want it to be a rebirth for so many of us, but it just feels like an untethering and unraveling. For me, it feels like an unraveling. And this is, I have devoted decades to locking and loading my metabolism and my hormones. And don't think I'm not on them. Don't, I'm on progesterone. (laughs) Don't get it. Don't get it. Thank God for progesterone. (laughs) Yeah. I am on testosterone. I am on thyroid hormone because of my hajis and my, you know, low thyroid function. And I have all these practices in place, you know, literally to mitigate these moments. And so when it started happening to me this year, I was so embarrassed by it initially. I didn't even say anything to my husband. I was just like, maybe I can hide this. Mm-hmm. You know, and because and then I was also in denial. I was like, oh, God, this can't, there's no way this is happening to me. I've spent years making sure this isn't going to happen to me. Like, this isn't coming for me. What did I do to deserve this? Like, I, I was on the receiving end of this for years. Like, how is it that now I'm the person who gets to carry this? And and then finally, there, you know, there's this level of acceptance that gets to happen that you get to do. And then I remember finally talking because we were starting to have we would have more fights in this little zone. And Alex is like, what the, what's going on right now? And I'm like, all right, I have something to confess. (laughs) You know that rage my mother has? 
<laughs> I got it. I got it. She gave it to me. She handed it over. I've been wondering like, what the heck is going on? I just figured it was perimenopause. It was PMS, whatever, but it's so much more than that. Like I'm trying my best to suppress this, but I can't. And now I need your help to make a plan. Like we both need to know because kind of comes on. It feels like within the, like the first day, my hormones, I call it, I really want to call it perimenopausal rage, but really it's hormone depletion rage. Mm -hmm. Let's call it what it is. Like your, my hormones are crashing just like all of ours do. If you're still kind of in that perimenopausal, you know, cycle, you're having your, you're having your menstrual cycle. Those hormones are crashing and my brain is having a profound impact. And I have major neurotransmitter depletion. I ran those labs a little like under a year ago. So I'm replenishing all of that. And it's like a possession that I can't. And, and it's a very, that first 24 hours, I don't kind of know what's happened. I just start getting more edgy, more irritable, more snappy. And then it feels like a full body takeover within about, and then I'm like, oh, oh, that's, I know what this is. You know, there's a lot of things I can share some of the things that I'm doing right now. And the, then the functional medicine kind of root cause kind of diagnostics I'm going into as well. But the first thing that I'm really doing is just making sure everyone's on team me. Yes. Team me, team mom, team. I run the whole show. We can't have me under-resourced, <laughs> yes. you know? And so that's the first thing is like letting everybody know, hey, I'm going through it. I scream into pillows. I take walks. I get more space. I do more radical self-care because I just need to be by myself in this time to get yes. myself together. I make sure that my blood sugar is balanced. I'm making sure that I'm prioritizing protein. I'm prioritizing hard. I mean, hard-ish workouts. I feel like this time of our cycle, it's not the time to really, really push. But sometimes when I'm in that much rage, I just feel the need to like, you know, do some pretty, lift some heavy stuff. Oh, so yeah. it's like heavy, that Heavy deadlifts balance. are my, yeah. like, that's my... I'm going to go, I'm, I'm either going to kill someone or I'm going to go deadlift 200 pounds. Yeah. I, I love snatch. <laughs> I love, exactly. I like snatches. I like deadlifts. Yeah. And so you're working those big muscles. I like a clean and press. And so I'm doing that kind of act, that movement and, and really essential using anything and everything in my power yes. to get it under control as best as I can. But a lot of time to myself, a lot of breaks, not easy when you've got a toddler who wants you only, but that, those are some of the things that I'm doing to navigate that. No, I, absolutely. I get it. I am a, I have a temper. I am, I came from a dad. My, actually, my mom is calm as a cucumber. When she's mad at you, she just stops talking to you for a few mm -hmm. days. <laughs> my it's dad. The passive aggression. <laughs> yeah. but she, my mom is a saint, but Aww. my dad, my dad has a temper and I never had a temper because I was sort of the, I had a very abusive sister with a terrible temper. So I was sort of at the receiving end of that abusive temper. But my goodness, it really hit me when I had, it actually was when I gave birth. So I was 25. So it wasn't even perimenopausal. It was what you said. It was like hormonal and neurotransmitter deficit rage. Oh, yeah. Nothing it, will tank you like childbirth. Yeah. Yeah. So we it wasn't talk enough about that. Yeah. It really was a, a very depleting experience for me. And I held a tremendous amount of resentment against my baby for it for years because I just mm -hmm. was never the same again until I finally got some and a good naturopathic doctor on my team. But any, all that to say is yes, absolutely. It's really important too, I think, for people to understand that letting your partners know where you're at and what you need. Like my husband loves to rush in when we're having a fight and I know better because when I'm in a rage, I can hear the words coming out of my mouth and my brain is like, what the hell, Tina? Like, what are you saying? And I can't always stop it. You, and can't, so un you can't unsay it. You can't stop it. It's, it's just, it's like a fire hose. Yes. Yeah, so it's like I'll, a dragon hose. Like, yeah, it's a dragon. It's a, I call it my dragon, actually. It's like in Game of Thrones when she just oh, yeah. torches everything because she's mad. I mean, I fully embody that and I feel it's it in my core. Like <laughs> yes, I'm like, the whole city. <laughs> like, just burn gone. it all down. Gone. So I retreat. I will go in the room and close the door or I will go and he comes after me. And I'm like, dude, mm -hmm. if I remove myself from the situation, trust me, I'm being the better person right now. I'm being a big person. Let me have my, it may take five minutes. It might take an You're hour flooded. and a half in the bathtub, but I yeah. am going to get my cortisol and my, yep. uh, you know, my adrenal put out under control. And so don't come in after these folks. And if mm -hmm. you are that person having the rage, learn to remove yourself and find something healthy. Like you said, a walk, a walk is a game changer. I never walk. come back from a walk mad. No, 
No, I, I, I take like three to four walks on those days. And I, I know people are thinking, well, oh, wow, that's a luxury. Oh, wow. Well, no, what a privilege. It's, it's what a privilege. A quick and it's not, laps. don't think I'm not getting my shit done. If, if that's not, could we can, my stuff done. <laughs> I am handling my business. Okay. Yeah. I am working. I am taking care of my son in the most gentle way possible. I am handling my family and I'm not killing people either. I'm not <laughs> chopping heads. And that's just what I need to do. And so I yell in cars. I yell in pillows. I get the energy out. I move my body. I meditate. But walking is the the thing. We live right at the ocean. So I go walk. I watch the surfers. And I give myself as I try. I'm really hard on myself. I'm not going to pretend like I'm not. like and But I do my best to give myself as much grace as possible in these moments. And, I also, and I'm also surrendering it up and praying that yep. I'm, I, this isn't going to be, I, I don't, I, I, I was thinking, and I know this is being hard on myself, but I'm like, I cannot be that rageful. I grew up with it. I know what it was. I, I know the impact it's had on me as a cycle breaker for my son. But I was like, this can't be happening in the most critical years of my child's life is his mama is working it out. Like she's trying to keep it together. And I just, I feel my, my, the level of compassion and empathy I have for my mother today. And I have for every woman who is going through it and caring so much and also a state in a time where their hormones are shifting and their bodies are changing without permission. Yes. Cause that's yes. what it feels like. And quickly, I and mean, quickly, Really quickly. And again, the stress component, I cannot emphasize that enough. Stress has ruined me in the past few years. And it is, you have to learn to pick your battles very carefully at this period of time, because it's all so, it's just brittle. Our hormones are brittle right now. And so really learning to pick those battles and then taking that time, there's nothing selfish about it. I saw a meme the other day. It was so good. It was like, it was a, you know, somebody said, don't you, it was like one woman going, don't you feel guilty taking time away from your child to go to the gym? And she's like, no, it's so I don't kill all of you. Exactly. <laughs> you know, something like that. It's like, learn to take those breaks, take that walk. It's just a few laps. You know, it's, it, it can be as short as that, but learn to disconnect, learn. I, I know when the rise is coming, I can feel it. Now. Oh yeah. It's like a pressure. fire. Yeah. So I'm like, In just me. get out, walk, stay off, you know, get offline, leave your phone. My dogs help me tremendously. Like just literally that just, oxytocin. Oh, well, it's the only dogs, thing that can trump stress, <laughs> you know, people don't realize your dogs go outside and pick up electrons for you. They go ground because they're on the ground with no shoes on. And then they come in and that's why you love grabbing mm. them and holding them because they flood you with negative mm. electrons, which ground that. you. So your dog is like a little grounding machine. So, you know, love your, don't, and don't, I, honestly, I've had rage on at like near my dogs too, where I start screaming at them and I'm like, oh, wait, they're dogs. They can't uh, not understand. They just want to make you me. happy. If there's anybody oh. in the world that wants to make you happy, it is your dogs. They're just oh, like, but you love me, right? You love me? Yeah, it's the worst. L little son, my, my son says such a sweet girl and she just looks at me like, why are you mad at me? And I'm like, oh, I am such a, I can't. And then you get it's guilt. You, you, girl. You, you feel guilt. You're like, oh, I'm yeah. a terrible person. So all of that has to just put it away. You also had a head injury, lady. That changes Everything. the whole game. So be kind to yourself. Yeah, initially, I thought it was the brain. I thought it was the concussions. I was like, ooh, is this rage coming on because of the concussions? And I think it's a lot of things. It's I, all of it. You know, it's the concussion. I stopped breastfeeding because of the concussions because I had to get on. I do high dose omegas. I just had to step up a lot of my protocols and I got breastfeeding until I was almost 44 years old. You know, concussions and talk about being just slammed into hormone depletion, perimenopause, it all just kind of happened all at once. And I don't know whose fault it is. What was the thing that turned the tide for me? But it was something or it was a combination of them all. all of but it. here I am in the lived experience of it. And I'm owning it. And I'm doing the best I can with the tools I have. And if this is my curriculum, so that I can show up for my ladies, then I'm here for it. And I'm going to, I'm going to do the best I can to navigate this. And there's obviously there's supplements that I'm taking and there's all the things, but also regulating my stress response system. That time of the month is not the time to bring on extra. You know yes. what I'm saying? That time of the month is not the time to, to take on a new project, to be in a big launch or, you know, and so we're just, we're navigating our mark, our business schedule, our marketing calendar. Like I don't need more to be, to bring me into that tipping point because I am a recovering 
I don't even know if I'm a recovering stressaholic. I like to tell people I am, but I don't know if that's actually true. I have a lot more skills than I used to have. I know the addictive nature of cortisol. My body knows it. My body, (laughs) every cell in my body knows what it feels like when my HPA axis is, is activated and deregulated. And so I am just so mindful about that. And I, that's what I can speak to about the stress piece is we just, we've got to be mindful about it because we can go off to the races so fast. We can flood the system so fast and it can feel like we're winning. Yes. It could feel like we're taking care of stuff, handling business, checking off lists, being the being to our families, to the community, to our business, to our, the, our team members on our business. We are in indis- I'm girl. I am the most indispensable. You know, I, I have made myself that way because my worth is tied to my. But I know that's a stress driver, and so I have a lot of ways of being mindful of not finding myself in that trap. In a way, I I call it a trap because I think I'm doing, I think I'm living my purpose. I think I'm living my mission, like disguised as I'm just living in my stress. (laughs) Yes. Oh my goodness. I'm so glad you said that because yeah, I am a cortisolaholic and Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. minute it hits and floods me, I'm like, I feel good Mm. and I've got this. I'm good at this. I I would have made a great emergency room physician. I... (laughs) Love it. And I get so in the zone. Like so zone. clear headed. Yep. My brain is firing. Everything is focused. <laughs> I'm just like, why is why is something that feels so good? So, so bad. For me? <laughs> well, it, let's talk about that. Tell people what cortisol does to you. Oh my, it's the ultimate. I mean, a lot of people will tell you, and I don't know where you stand on this, Tina. I'd be curious that, you know, your gut is kind of the epicenter of disease. But the one thing that I find that trumps that, if you are in the camp of the gut is, you know, again, harbors the 70 plus percent of our immune system. And obviously is that kind of intimate connection to the external world. But the one thing that can trump, you know, gut issues, gut dysbiosis, all that is stress. I mean, stress, you want to like light up insulin resistance, be stressed. It's the fastest way to cause, you know, hyper insulinemia real quick, like boom, you want to force your thyroid to have to work harder. You want to put your mitochondria in overdrive. You want to shut down your digestive system and everything. I mean, it's when you are in high alert, the only thing that your body knows to do is survive. That's it. And survive means you sh- everything else in terms of equilibrium and homeostasis gets pushed to the wayside. And that's where we start to see an uptick in inflammation, an uptick in, you know, and in, in a de- decline in neurotransmitters, in cravings, in, in belly fat, in metabolic dysfunction. You want to drive metabolic dysfunction, be stressed. Yeah, that's it. Just be stressed. And we are in that lived experience. There is no one in this world more in a stressed lived experience than women and women in that trend in this transition. This is the second puberty. I I always, (laughs) yep. It's, that's such a great way to put it. It destroys your sleep, which destroys everything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, there's nothing. My mentor always tried to really get me to understand the critical devastating impact stress was having on me. And I always just blew it off because yeah, I think you and I are a lot alike. We're like, oh, we're good. We're tough. I'm good. We it's can fine. handle it. It's I'm almost still like in a badge my 20s of... and 30s. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. It's like a badge of honor. Like, yeah, look how much I can handle while everybody else falls to the wayside, mm-hmm. you know, but it will destroy you when you hit my age. <laughs> yeah. You only have <laughs> I am living so much I... resilience. I saw a picture of myself the other day from October, 2019. And I look like an entirely different person. Like I look completely different than I do now. And it was just all these years of stress, taking on the narrative, fighting the, you know, what I thought was the good fight. And in the end, I'm like, why did I do that? Like pick your battles, people. This is not, it doesn't end well. Years and years of stress. We have to really, and that, that might be small. It might be, you know, getting into it with your spouse or fighting over something negligible that it might have mattered in your 20s or 30s. But as you get in your 40s, it's like, does this really matter? You know, responding to somebody online, it's like, meh. 
you feel the impact of it. Oh. If you're wondering why your sleep is struggling, if you're wondering why you're struggling with migraines, if you're wondering why all of a sudden, again, the, the perimenopausal rage, if you're wondering why you're dealing with, you're seeing metabolic numbers shift, your triglycerides are going up, your HDL is going down, you're seeing your fasting blood sugar go up, you, and this isn't a, a metabolic number, but you're looking at your C-reactive protein and it's creeping. You have to look at some of these bigger foundational pieces, stress being one of those big ones. And we live in a society where, again, we're told to take it all on and it gets really freaking hard to continue to take it all on and in your hormones are shifting. And let me tell you, and your metabolism is shifting. I, this is a stat you probably share a lot with your audience, but by the time women are 45 years old, 88% of us will be, will have at least one or more markers of metabolic dysfunction and are more likely to be obese or overweight than men. 45, not 52, not menopause. I'm talking about like your halfway point through peri is where we start to see the decline. And in that, and it's a compilation of things, right? It's a comp, it's stress, it's poor sleep, it's hormone changes, and it's poor metabolic health going into the most critical time and transition of your life. Yes, it is. I joke that I trained for menopause because you have to start in your early 40s. Yes, you do. Or your late 30s. Or and late 30s. You... I think it's late 30s. When oh, you yeah. start to feel the shift, when, when you start to notice progesterone is shifting for you, and, and I'm talking about you're triggered, you're noticing the PMS symptoms, you're noticing your sleep issues, you're noticing mood, but you're not as well resourced. Like you just know something shifts. Yeah. That's when, that's the warning sign. That's the red flag that you need to double down on your metabolic health and start bringing in some support, whether it's supplementation, whether it's bioidentical progesterone, like we got to figure it out mm -hmm. because that's when you're starting to tick. That's like the clock ticking down for you. And I knew for me that that was very much the case. I remember, I didn't know at the time, 30, 36 or so dealing with insulin resistance. Who's thinking about insulin resistance in their mid thirties? Not a lot of us are, but man, obviously it needs to be on our radar. If 80, if 88% of us by 45 are locked, like lockstep in, in insulin resistance and in heading in towards more prediabetes, right? And I mean, obviously figured it out very quickly. And I was like, oh my gosh, no, this is a metabolic problem. I'm, I'm blaming it on cortisol. I'm blaming yes. it on stress. I'm blaming it on fatigue, but no, this is a mitochondrial issue. This is a metabolic issue. And we, we, all of us, whether, you know, we obviously have got to deal with stress. I've done a lot of trauma work. I've done a lot of subconscious reprogramming, a lot of that. And I have worked on rebuilding my cellular batteries because trauma work or not, if I don't have the mitochondria to support me to move through this next couple of decades, it, it's about to become a hot, hot mess situation. And if you keep driving the stress train, mm -hmm. you'll just keep burning out that good work you did. Yeah. That's what I found. It's like, doesn't matter how many times I rebuild, I blow it. I, the minute I get a little juice in the battery, I'm like, let's blow it all. <laughs> Oh, extra. Let's light the candle from, oh, I got burning both ends. Let's add some wicks and burn it all down, you know? So you have to relearn how to live. You have to relearn how you do life and how you respond to life. And I've actually, like, I'm discontinuing my mastermind at the end of this month. I'm You're, discontinuing yeah. my membership portal. I'm getting rid of so many things because... I just need some bandwidth to decide. I'm going to be 50 in February. And like, I feel like I need to decide how I want to live the second part of my life. And I was I, celebrating I you so big. <laughs> I knew I was like, she is letting go of stuff that isn't serving her anymore. She is letting go. She is not accommodating, you know, and I just, I wanted to celebrate you. I, anytime women are letting something go, like letting something big go, I know that they're at a point where like, you know what, this isn't serving. This isn't going to take me to that next place. And then in that next journey for me. And I just love that when you shared that with me, I was like, yeah, I was like, get it, girl, let it go, <laughs> let get rid of it. Um, I agree. You know, other things that I've done, if you are addicted, maybe you don't even know it. <laughs> I mean, you're addicted to cortisol and you oh, don't I know am. it. You're listening Two things that I did to really to because I know. I've been knowing I've, I've had major, I have Hajimoto's because of it. Yep. I've had chronic fatigue because of it. Like best believe I know I have this issue and, and I was abused my whole life. I got trauma. So like, so two things I did one, I put on a CGM and I, I didn't put on a CGM for just tracking blood sugar. I wanted to know when I was stressed. Yeah. You want to see Shocking. stress? <laughs> 
you Shocking. haven't eaten anything and your blood sugar is hitting 140 <laughs> milligrams per deciliter, that's stress, ladies. That's yeah. stress, everybody. So put a CGM on for a month and see what's going on with you. And then also a whoop strap. I wore a whoop strap and it has a stress. It measures your stress in real time 24 seven. And so at any given time, I can look and see where my stress is. And again, it just creates that what I call body awareness and body literacy, which we really need to understand and know, because again, you can easily convince yourself that isn't that stress isn't what it is um, until you've got the devices to actually kind of measure you in real time. And then you can start to connect the dots of like, oh, when I'm feeling this way, when I'm in this zone, this is actually stress working against me quietly behind the scene, I really need to come up with a better way to approach this. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I think both of those are such good. My continuous glucose monitor is, man, it's crazy. It sh Your blood sugar will spike anticipating stress. Yep. You don't even have to have the stress. Just me anticipating going to the airport and all of a sudden, shh, shoots up. It's crazy. And I had no idea the damage I've been doing to myself over the years. Yeah. While I was oh my in, gosh. I a was blood like sugar spike. Like, do you know what, I mean, we now oh know gosh. the, you know, the level of inflammation, even just one blood sugar spike is having on the system. Your body has to adjust to that. Yes. Your pancreas has to deal with that. Your insulin has to respond to that. Um, and so it's a cascade. That stress response is such a big multi-tier inflammatory cascade that is so insidious that a lot of us, again, it's often, it's a badge of honor. And we, you know, women, we think we're winning when it's the case. And we're <gasps> No, not. we're just destroying our beauty and our happiness. <laughs> Yeah, really we're causing I'm glycation. I'm, like, I'm want done. Some wrinkles? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm done aging. I have to reverse this. I got to <laughs> slow the roll. When people are like, I had somebody the other day say, we need more access to you. You have to create some ways that we can have access to you. And I was <sighs> like, oh, contraire. I think everybody needs way less access to me. <laughs> I'm, I am in the time of my life where everybody, including my family, gets less access to me. I am taking care of Tina now. I am tired of taking care of people. I have been taking care of people my entire life. And we're the token doctors in the family. So we get that no matter what, like there's the family. You're always there's the gonna, yeah. It always, always. comes to I'm you always, first. Yep, I'm I get the call. It. My sister it's had a stroke this year. I got the first call. And so everybody calls me, you know, and, oh, and everybody. Yeah. And it's like big families. Then there's the husband's family. I feel, you know, I try to practice gratitude for the fact that people trust me, but it becomes a bit exhausting. And well, the other night advocating on the phone with doctors. Oh, it's, yeah. You're the one on the phone. You're the one talking to everybody. You're the one having labs sent to you. You're the one who has the ex, you know, all that's getting sent to you so yes. that you can look over it. Yes. That's, and it's then, exhausting. It's a lot. It requires a lot of energy. Strangers online are like, can I send you my MRI? And they send Wait, you a novel. Wait, what do you mean? Can like, you? They just do. I know. I, and then they wonder why I don't respond. I'm like, I don't, I can't I do can't. it. But the thing that I have just recently started doing, which is so nuts. My husband finally convinced me to leave my cell phone outside of the room. In fact, mm -hmm. he insisted, which is so funny because suddenly- The bedroom, he's, right? The bedroom. Yeah, the bedroom. Yeah. He's, he's insisted. And I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it, Marisa. I, for weeks, I was like, I can't do it. And he said, why? I'm like, I am the doctor in the family. Do you not understand that I get the call when the shit goes down? And shit always goes down in the wee hours of the morning or night. So- I can't not be there. And finally, I realized I was like, you know what? Good luck to all of them. I'm taking the phone out of the room because I do not need to be irradiating my head and my body while I sleep. Mm. And my sleep has gotten so much better. And my aura ring is telling me oh, that yeah, my, girl. Like, my heart rate variability your went truth. up. Like, yeah, heart rate variability. And I mean, but you're, again, you are indispensable to your family, to your people. It's just so much so much that we carry. And, but look, yeah. I mean, look at you making that decision to not be Huge. so available. Huge. And I'm sleeping much better. So, you know, fingers crossed that everybody makes it out. I mean, I've got They're a daughter who's 23 who lives alone and I've got uh, aging parents who are sickly and I'm just like, yeah. Oh God, you know, please. I, that's it. I give it to God. I just pray and give it to God that I'll hear the phone ring from out in the kitchen if I need it, you know, but I can't keep this up. Whatever this has been, it's no longer serving me. And I hear you saying the same. So <laughs> yeah, and we get, to be, we get to hopefully be the women, the doctors, the, the hormone experts, the metabolic experts who set boundaries and healthy boundaries and that we inspire other women to do so. 
Yes. I just want to inspire other women to do so too. I can still take care of my people and have healthy boundaries. I have friends of mine, they're like, girl, your boundaries, damn, damn, girl. <laughs> I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, they're sexy, aren't they? You want those, <laughs> don't you? I have so many of my best friends are like, damn, those are some boundaries. I'm like, yeah. And I take care of mine. I take care of my people, but I got to take, I have learned the hard way. I have to take care of me, especially yes. in those moments where I am not good to anybody. Like, don't, don't come at me when I'm in that place, when that late luteal phase, let me do me so that I can do what's best for my family. Well, you won't be around long or in good capacity later if you don't do it now and you've got a little one you know i've got a grown little, daughter little but you've one. got a little one so. i know yours is 20 years old, older than mine you know? <laughs> <laughs> i don't even know how that's possible she's so cute she she's so cute she's my biggest supporter she always tells mm -hmm. me what a hero i am but she keeps me in check she's like mom you're way too stressed out you've got to whatever it is stop doing it mm -hmm. or put it away and my dog sans is right here right now actually telling me we got to go for a walk she comes up when she senses me if I sit too long, she comes up and nudges me with her nose and she's like, it's time to get up and, and move. So, you know, it's a matter of listening at that point, I think for us, are we listening and are we learning and are we taking action? And I hear you do, you know, saying that you are, and I definitely am trying. So I'm, I'm so glad we reconnected recently and we get me to too. stay in touch get through do this life, process. <laughs> do life together, do perimenopause, menopause together. <laughs> I mean, and that's the other thing, get, you know, get your ladies, have your group, your yeah. community. We you know we're not meant to do this alone. We, we were never meant to do this alone. Especially and women. Women need the oxytocin need, that we get from the group. We need that connection. I need my voice memos. I need my, you know what I'm saying? I need my people and I need real interaction. I need real hugs. I yeah. need, you know, I really need that. That's the one hormone. You want to bet on a hormone that's going to, you know, going to ju just suppress that cortisol. It's always going to be oxytocin. Yeah. Yeah. We get that from chopping brightly colored vegetables, sitting in groups and speaking with other women. So think of women, you know, think of hunter gatherer societies of like women weaving baskets, preparing food together in a circle. That's why you see that because culturally we think it's like, oh, that's what they do culturally. No, that's what we need as women. And if we don't have our oxytocin, our estrogen goes to shit and we turn into mean, you know, our male dominant hormones take over and we get pissy. We can't always be in our power. I, I always try to tell that to my husband because he's such a stern, gruff guy, but he's so sweet with me. And when he gets stern, when he gets tired, he gets stern and gruff with me. And I always tell him, I'm like, honey, I'm always in my masculine energy because I am running shit. I need the soft, sweet, sexy version of you because that's what brings out my estrogen and that's what brings out my oxytocin. Mm -hmm. So if you want a hardened mean bitch for a wife, then be gruff and stern with me and be a grump. But if you want the best of me and you want the world to see the best of me, I need, I need that strong man to be kind and sexy and soft with me. You know, I need a safe place to land because exactly. I'm running, you need to I'm feel running safe. shit all day. Yep. I don't need to be running shit in my house. Mm -mm. <laughs> No, we need to feel safe. We need to be held. We need to feel safe, you know, yes. that we can step into our feminine. You know, almost every woman I meet is in their masculine all the time. They are handling so much. They are carrying so much. And yeah. we just need a safe place to land, whether it's with our girls, whether it's with our partners, whoever, you know, just have that safe place to land. And I am a big fan of, of, of chosen family you know, of your yes, people, me too. <laughs> just having that. And I know we're in a loneliness epidemic as well. And one of the things I recommend to you, if there's people that you haven't talked to in a while, or if there's someone who you've lost contact with, just pick up the phone, shoot a text, say, Hey, I was thinking about you. How are you doing? Like, I know it's been a long time. I'd love to just know how you are. Maybe we can get on a phone call. And I'll tell you it's it, nine out of 10. They're going to be like, Oh my goodness. Like, let's do that. You know, like us. And yeah. so you know, it doesn't need to be complicated. It just shoot that little text message out. I know it's about to be, it's getting cold everywhere. It's that time of the year where we want to have that closeness and that connection. And so that was one of the things I'd recommend too, is just without my girls, I don't know if I could navigate this at all. I love that. That's so important. I'm such a hermit that I will isolate to a fault. So that brings up another thing that just kind of slides in with this is 
when you're not in a good space, well, for me, at least when I'm not in a good space or I'm feeling overwhelmed, I will detach. And because I don't want to say anything negative, I don't want to be that negative energy in the friendship or in the situation. So when people are like, how are you? I'm so honest that I'll be like, I'm doing shitty. <laughs> I, I appreciate your authentic <laughs> honesty, though. I, I want to hold, like, for, as, as a friend, like I want to hold space for it. And not take it on either, which is hard for us as women to do. Yeah, that's the <laughs> it's balance, a skill. Right? It's <laughs> but I don't ever want to be putting that out there. And so I will self-isolate and mm. I will hermit down, which is, you know, not great either. So what you say is so important. It's I always feel so much better when I see my friends and I see my girls and I give them hugs and, you know, we do cool shit together. That's, the best. that's what it's about. It's, the best. it's what it yeah. is. Well, you think about at the end of the day, you know, obviously we're going through it. Our hormones are changing. Our bodies are changing without permission. Maybe metabolically, we made not so, some great decisions in our 20s and our 30s and we're trying to clean it up right now. But, you know, one of the things that we, we really deserve and we really need as we navigate these journeys is that connection is those relationships to help support us in those moments because it gosh it is so hard to do it alone it's mm -hmm. so hard to not feel good alone and a lot of us we're all in the lived experience of it we're all going through it we're all struggling with sleep we're all having we're all having those late luteal rage or mood swings or maybe that maybe maybe for you it's that you're crying uncontrollably like whatever it may look like when your hormones take a tank and they're already tanking it's extra, you know, and so having, <laughs> I'm like, wait, they're tanking and they're tanking at the same time. Like, what do you mean? Um, that we really, we deserve connection. That's how we get through this onto the other side. And so getting those voice memos, like I just send lots of love to all my girlfriends, like a couple times a week. And I never know when they're going to respond back. And it's just the best feeling when someone, you know, on a Thursday afternoon, there's a voice memo and it's just, it's the best feeling ever. And then the other thing I really love to cultivate through gratitude is joy. And having a toddler makes it really easy. I'm not going to lie. Like we, <laughs> we did our first jack-o'-lantern and Kingston Aww. named him pumpkin. And I was like, okay, all right, we, let's go with that. And it's just these moments of joy. And one of the things I've learned in cultivating joy is gratitude and joy move in an upward spiral. So the more that I'm grateful for those moments, as I'm grateful for the lived experience of getting to navigate this new curriculum. As hard as it is sometimes, and as much as I'm struggling with it, I know that there is something to be had from this that I get to walk away from, even if it's just conversation with you, Tina, but that I get to create more spontaneous moments of joy. And I think that at the end of the day, what else are we here for? Yes. You know, like what's the point of it all? And, and when I check in, it's deep connection with my friends. It's loving my family. And it's those moments of joy that we all deserve to have. And joy gets to be free. No one can take that from you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what, what's happening in your life, no one can strip that from you. You control that. And those are the things that I anchor onto as I'm navigating this hot mess of a second puberty transition, you know, and doing it with as much grace as I can possibly manage. <laughs> that's perfect. I think that's a perfect place to even close because I think that's the message. That's the one thing I have noticed about you most is that you bring so much joy and gratitude. You even say thank you when I share hard, hard things that I'm going through. You say thank you for sharing that with me. And your voice memos give me a lot of joy. So... <laughs> I love it. Can you let, let everyone know where to find you? Because you have so many great offers out there. You've got a great podcast. You've got some books out. Let them know. Yes. yes. So the podcast is Energized with Dr. Marisa. I want to embody what we all want more of. At least that's what I, I energy is the ultimate currency to me. Give me more of that. So Energized with Dr. Marisa. Dr. Tina's on the show. It's all about women's hormone health, metabolic health in our 40s and beyond. Kind of similar to a little bit to the show. And then I have a beautiful guide. You know, I know that cooking and figuring out how to love up on our hormones is, is really about that nutrition. And so I have a, a guide that's my 14 most epic recipe for helping to support your hormones. So I have that little guide. And then my books are on Amazon at Dr. Marisa. You can find me at Dr. Marisa on Instagram as well. Spell it for them so that they oh, know. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not spelled the way it's said. <laughs> it's at D-R-M-A-R-I-Z-A. -A. So at Dr. Marisa. Yes. I love that you have a Z because I have a Y. So we're, yes. you know, <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We've got to have you back. We, I need more of this. I always love talking to you. So it's always a treat. Thanks, Annie. Thanks for having me.